Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I wanted to do a general discussion video about my experience of reading the book My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Tessa Moshveg while I was reading Jacob's Room by uh, Virginia Woolf. I don't know why I struggled with that. Um, this video I think could be perceived as a critique, especially if you don't go towards the end, but I do promise you there's a general thought process that's going in my mind now the question is can i translate my thoughts to an actual video well today we'll be experimenting with that but it, it will probably at times sound like i'm being rude i'm just going to be perfectly blunt with you um there is a critique in all of this but i think at, at, as a whole it just is more an exploration of what I find to be a good book, what I find makes a good book, uh, what I am myself looking when I read books. And I think because reading is so personal and it's such a subjective experience that is also very often based on your own experiences and your own well, opinions, well, you, you can't help but um, want to criticize things that maybe other people's really enjoyed or even praise something that other people's really, really hated. So I kind of wanted to, <clears throat> I kind of wanted to get into that with you guys today. Uh, now, let me describe the setting. So My Year of Rest and Relaxation is a very popular current uh, novel about this woman who decides that she's just basically going to give in to her depression and self-medicate in the aims of just sleeping a year of her life away. Okay, so that's my year of rest and relaxation. It takes pl place in New York City. Uh, it takes place in 2000, either year 2000, right before se uh, September 11th. So you can feel the lead up uh, to 9-11. And it's, you know, a very young, privileged uh, white woman. Now we compare that to Virginia Woolf's Jacob's Room, where you're gonna see the plots are very, very different. The plots have really nothing to do with my, um, well, with what I'm discussing today, but Jacob's Room is basically um, a, a book that revolves around this young man named Jacob. Now, the book isn't really necessarily about Jacob. It's basically how you would, um, if you were to imagine a movie or just a scene where you have a prime character, Jacob, who's just walking along the street, and he's going to anchor the plot of this book. So he's just walking along the street, and you can imagine the camera moving constantly in a circular motion around him, and as it moves, it catches snippets of this conversation, snippets of this conversation, snippets here, snippets here, and by the time it comes back, he is already he has gone forward in this linear path. So it's gone forward a few maybe days or months or years in his lifespan and you just follow him like that. So basically you're just constantly circling around this character of Jacob as you go through his um, well moments in his life. And the thing I wanted to, to, to talk about is that in terms of, well, I guess plot does make sense to, to discuss, but in terms of plot, neither one of these books really necessarily has a plot. Uh, the books both feature a singular uh, individual and the book kind of revolves around them. Um, My Year of Rest of re Relaxation, <clears throat> the point of view is from the protagonist herself, so you do get um, more of her thought process, but you still get um, her interaction with other characters, which kind of leads to that sort of circular motion. But the thing is that when it comes to me finishing off uh, my year of rest and relaxation, I was talking to another booktuber who really, really enjoys this book. And I was trying to describe why I didn't actually care for this book. And there was moments where I said, well, I didn't feel like it represented depression very well. But this booktuber said, well, actually I liked it because it represented depression very well on the contrary. And that I'm perf that. I totally understand that because how people would experience depression is very different uh, 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 according to the individual, whether it's a um, <clears throat> more uh, a genetic depression or if it's a situational depression, maybe a seasonal depression, we can all deal, deal with depression in many, many ways. But for me personally, the, 
the depiction of depression, while there, the idea of self-medicating and just wanting to sleep your life away, all of that was there. But I think it's not even the fact that I thought the depression was unrealistic. When I, when I step back and really think about it, for me, it was just the writing. It comes down to the writing. And here's where I'm going to be. I'm going to sound very rude and I'm going to sound very blunt. But the thing is that I find this writing and it's going to sound a little hypocritical. It's very well done. The plot was really well represented. The character was really represented and it was well polished. And I can't fault the writing whatsoever in a sort of technical sense. But uh, in terms of individual taste, did I actually like the writing? I can't say that I did. I don't like this writing. And this is the type of writing that I would say, if you told me that, um, you know, Altesa, so Altesa Moshveg wrote, wrote this book, but if you told me the writer of My Dark Vanessa wrote this book, if you told me if Emily St. John Mindell wrote this book, if you told me that Sheila Haiti wrote this book, if you told me that any other sort of contemporary female writer that's popular these days had written this book, I would believe you. Because this is what I would call, and again, right now I'm going to be as rude, I'm going to be very, very rude with this um, criticism. But again, I think I'll hopefully be able to prove that this all goes in a more positive direction. But this kind of writing where it feels like any sort of contemporary and I'm going to say female author, and I'm going to get to why I say female author, where any contemporary female author could write this book, that feeling, for me is what I call um, a master's in creative writing kind of book, where um, everyone who, so I can't write this book. I'm not going to tell you that I could write this book. I'm not going to tell you, oh, I could have done better. If I had written this, it would have been such and such. No, I can't write a book. I'm not a writer. I'm not creative in that sense. I could not write this. But I do think that anyone with a master's in creative writing and who has gone through that sort of education could write this book and write it in a similar way as Otessa Moshveg has written it. So while it's very well done, technically there's no criticism there's just for me, there's a lack of depth. There's a lack of, of flavor. There's a lack of individual personality from the author that I, that I realize is something I want. Okay. Now, before I get into the connection with Virginia Woolf, I'm going to go back to that point where I said any contemporary female author. Uh, now the reason I have to state that is because I realized, um, as I was preparing my thoughts for this video, is that I actually haven't written, sorry, not written, I haven't actually really read a lot of contemporary male authors of this time. Um, usually, if I read a contemporary male author, it's usually uh, nonfiction. Uh, they're either writing um, a biography or a history book or a criticism on something. So that's the only reason I'm singling, sing, singular, sing, singling out. It's the only reason I'm singling out the whole idea of a contemporary female writer. Uh, this, it's not a question of gender bias. It's just that's the representation. That's that's the sample <laughs> that I'm working with right now. Okay. Okay. So now how does this fit in with Virginia Woolf? Well, Virginia Woolf, and I should state that this is the first time I read both of these authors. I've never read Otessa Moshe before and I've never read Virginia Woolf before. But Virginia Woolf um, has I mean, in the book Jacob's Room, and again, I haven't read her other works, but in Jacob's Room, which I know, I know, having read a little bit of Virginia Woolf's background, was a really big uh, technical, um, so it was a, a very big divergence from her regular writing in terms of its technical, in terms of like the technique behind it. And the thing is that Jacob's room basically has no plot and it focuses again, again, it focuses on a singular character who doesn't have much personality, who we don't really care about um, because we're not really let into their thought process. So here we are let, let into the thought process, but we, we don't, I mean, I didn't like this character and I don't think a lot of people like this character. Uh, not that you need to like a character, but there's gotta be a little something to latch onto. And here I just couldn't latch onto anything. So Jacob's room as well, the character of Jacob, you're not really supposed to latch onto him. He just kind of exists to be an anchor for this, you know, the everyday life that happens around you. Okay. 
But the thing with um, Virginia Woolf's writing, and I, I've, I, I don't have anything to hold up for, for, for that book because I read her via, um, I read her online. I read her via Project Gutenberg. And the thing with Virginia Woolf's writing is that it is so entrancing. It just, it's absolutely stunning in a way that I've never read before. There is something about her writing that was just absolutely spectacular. And the way, the best way I can, I can describe it is this concept of writing the obvious. So Altessa Moshfeg um, and a lot of uh, authors of, of this sort are very good at writing, but I think they're very good at writing the obvious in an obvious way. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try to explain what I mean by that is that if anyone were to, even if you're not a creative, um, even if you don't have a master's in creative writing or you don't have any creative writing background, if you put in the effort, even just a little bit, even if it's just to write a paragraph or just to write a page, uh, maybe you wrote it for an essay um, in school or whatnot. If you put in the effort, you could come up with a technically well-written paragraph or page. You might not be able to write an entire book. I know I certainly could not, but you could come up with a very, a very proper, good way to write about a certain topic that is fairly obvious. And I'll give you an example with um, an assignment I had to write in high school where it was uh, the beginning of the school year. And so just to sort of warm us up, the teacher assigned us an assignment where we had to write one page about a certain memorable event that happened during our summer. And I chose um, so I always spend my summers in France and I chose, um, our, my, and we would always spend it. So we, my parents would send us off to France to spend the summers with our cousins and grandparents and aunts and uncles and whatnot. It's a wonderful childhood, absolutely just the fondest memories ever. And it was, um, near our, our home near, near the ocean, our family, uh, a family, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's it a home near the ocean. And we always go to the market to pick up fruits and vegetables and whatnot. And it was very often my and my cousin's duty to buy strawberries. And the thing about French strawberries is they taste absolutely amazing. Just superb. Like, just, huh. I mean, basically any strawberry that's not an American strawberry is good. But that's, that's an, a digression we're not going to get into. But... Strawberries are so good. So it was very common that we would go buy strawberries and by the time we get back home, half of the package would be gone. And I wrote in my essay about how my cousin and I had uh, dropped off the strawberries um, in the kitchen and my grandfather opened it up and said all the strawberries and was like, all oh, the strawberries are gone. And I wrote, we were caught red handed. Okay. And my teacher wrote, cute, clever. And it was, I thought it was very cute and very clever and very imaginative. You know, you eat all the strawberries, your hands get stained from all the strawberry juice. They get stained red. You're caught red handed for having eaten all the strawberries, etc., etc. It was very creative, but it's a very obvious metaphor, both figuratively and literally. Like I think anybody else could come up with that eventually. Like that I'm not going to say like I wrote this unique phrase, turn of phrase or whatnot. It's not anything. Anyone could come up with that if they um, were in the same situation. And that was the topic they were writing about. And that's how I feel about these kind of contemporary books. They're all well written. They're all well done. But with a little bit of effort, someone could probably write it and write it in that same way. While Virginia Woolf, she takes the obvious and she writes about it. But the thing about her writing is that you don't understand that it's obvious until she writes about it. Okay. And I'm going to take the most basic example I came, um, I found, um, while I was reading because basically you could highlight the entire book, but for some reason, this particular phrase really hit me. So I'm going to read it to you. Okay. A load of snow slipped and fell from a fir branch. Later, there was a mournful cry. A motor car came along the road, shoving the dark before it. The dark shut down behind it. Okay. Seems obvious, but the whole, for me, it was the whole thing. A motor car comes along the road, 
shoving the dark before it. And that was sublime. I thought that turn of phrase, that way of describing a car coming, you know, driving up through the night, I thought that was absolutely genius and just absolutely stunning. And just, again, it's, it's something that's so obvious once it's written, once Virginia Woolf writes it, it's like, of course, a motor car shoving the dark before it. it seems so obvious, but I think only Virginia Woolf could have written that sentence. Okay. So that's where I'm kind of going with this is that when it comes to these contemporary modern, these contemporary books, and I find that a lot of them, I just can't latch on to them. I find them well done. I think more or less, a lot of them have a good plot. They're very technically well crafted. They're polished, they're clean, but there's just a little, there's a lack of flavor. There's a lack of personality. There's a lack of Maybe, maybe it's experimentation. Maybe it's a lack of courage in really pushing uh, your writing. I don't know what it is, but for me, this is what, again, a master's in creative writing kind of writing style. So that's that. Now, as I said, a lot of this might've sounded really rude, really criticism. Oh, you just want to be this. Why are you criticizing Tessa Moshveg? I really like her. It's the point is not to criticize her, but it's to sort of, again, by analyzing these these writing styles, I can definitely see my personal reading taste come from. Now, and I also want to say that sometimes, you know, it doesn't matter what the writing is. If you connect to the plot and you connect to the to the book itself, that's all that matters. And I'm going to give you an example. And I don't have the book because I sold it, but it's the book Motherhood by Sheila Haiti. I mentioned her as another example of what I considered masters in creative writing kind of style. And Motherhood is a book about this young woman in her early 30s who is struggling with the idea of whether or not she wants a child. And I have to be blunt with you. I thought the writing was pretty bad. Like I did not like the writing style at all. I didn't like the way the book was presented. I thought it was a lot. I thought it was kind of cheesy at times. There's one passage where she's talking about a knife on a kitchen table and then they include like a kitchen table or something. She talks about a knife being placed on, a, on an object. And in the book themselves, they include pictures in that chapter. And the only thing I could think of is of when I saw those pictures is like, well, yeah, the written dis this description of this knife placed on this object is so poorly done that you need the pictures to be able to visually represent what the author is actually trying to write. So I thought the writing was not really good, but again, that I was really rude, but I want to read to you the review that I wrote when I wrote this book, when I re read this book, because I think you'll see that there was, the book triggered something in me emotionally that made me as a whole actually think the book was really, really good. So again, I didn't like the writing, but the book did something to me that was just something unexpected. So let's, so it's a little bit of a long review. And when I write reviews, because this is always, these reviews are for personal use. They're not for like publishing. They're not really for sharing. Um, there are spelling mistakes, there are grammar mistakes, and I'll try and correct them as I read. But if the review sounds choppy, it's because this isn't a review that's meant to be like published. Okay. So I'm going to start. Uh, this book is a, is way out of the realm of my typical reads, a book I would never have picked up on my own at a bookstore. Had I simply glanced it on a shelf, it took a booktuber to make me notice it. What was it about this book that made me decide to pick it up? It was a curiosity, a curiosity to see if Shayla Haiti could manage to capture my feelings. You see, the book is about a woman in her thirties who is trying to cope with the idea that she might not want to have a child. The narrator is a writer with a boyfriend she believes to love and a life she seems more or less content with, but she can't shake off the feeling that she is supposed to be doing more to be producing more, or maybe is supposed to be producing something. She spends the book using coin flipping to help make decisions when questioning her relationship with her boyfriend, her friends, her unborn potential child, her mother, and to herself. She, de she debates whether she is deceiving everyone, just herself, or if she is the one being deceived. 
It's a constant back and forth between trying to convince herself that she wants a child or that she should want a child. And right when she decides she does indeed want a child, she goes right back to wondering if this is her decision or the decision society is making for her. It's a story about indecision, desire, contradiction, obligation, and it's all done with a blatant honesty. There are no romantic notions, the sex is blunt, and the narrator's back and forth can get tiring, but that's what makes the book a success. Because I am also a woman in her 30s who is trying to cope with the idea that I might not want a child. And this book captures my feelings in more ways than I can say. Saying that you don't want a child can seem like a simple enough decision, but in all honesty, it's a decision encased with indecision and fear and hesitation and shame. It's hard to look at your friends and understand their excitement as they get pregnant and have children. It's hard to understand why you could care less about having a baby placed in your arms. I never in my youth had a desire to name my future children. And as an adult, I never got the warmth of emotion that accompanies many women when they see babies. Some babies are cute, yes, but that is a rational statement I am making. If a baby is legitimately cute, then I can't rationally deny its cuteness just because of my lack of maternal affection. But I can't pretend that all babies are magically beautiful and innocent and pure just because they are in a state of babiness. Some readers criticize the narrator's wallowing and inability to make a decision and her wishy-washiness, but Haiti captured that feeling so tremendously well. I have also tried to change my mind due to my circumstances, make excuses as to why maybe now I don't want a baby, but obviously I'll want one in the future, because of course that should be my innate desire as a woman. I've tried to persuade myself that I didn't want a baby because I was too young to be married. I wasn't yet on the right career course. I didn't have enough money to provide for a child, yet I didn't have, or I didn't have the right partner. Maybe once I found the right man, I would want to have a child with him. Even if I didn't necessarily want a child myself, if the man I loved did, maybe I could do this thing for him. Maybe love would make me want to have a child. See, it's so easy to come up with excuses. Then the narrator reflects on her relationship with her mother and wonders if something in that relationship might have led to her lack of maternal instinct. She notes how her mother also seemed to be more occupied with looking out for her own mother than she did her own child. It's a culture of looking back instead of forward, the narrator seems to conclude. And from that, I looked at my own family and noticed a similar pattern. My grandmother admits that she was never born to be a mother, despite having had four children. She did because that's, one, that's what one did back then. It was a product of the times, but she really wished she could have stayed wild longer, stayed and married longer. My grandmother, my grandmother once even told me that if she had been born in my generation, she would have fun with men, an option not available to her. My own mother has always complained about her mother's lack of motherly attention. Now, I didn't lack in motherly attention as my mother was an amazing woman, but in my eyes, she was amazing for many more things other than just being a mother. It was my mother's intelligence, charisma, and intelligence again, strong sense of self that made me idolize her. But my mother also has never been one to dote on others' children. She loved her own children, of course, but never really cared for others. She has never requested grandchildren and certainly has never really exp expressed an interest in becoming a, a grandmother. Only in the last, last month have we discovered that my brother is going to have a child, her first and quite possibly only grandchild. And as we discussed our future travel plans, she said that she guessed she'll have to go visit the kid at its birth to support her son. So my mother, having been such a tremendous role model for me, was her lack of interest in babies also conditioned in me. Is this reason I seem to just not care? Such thoughts this book guided me through, it almost seemed like the book was written for me, and that's why I was captivated by the book. Even if the writing style was a bit more experimental and contemporary than I tend to like in my books, the message was powerful. The other day I had an appointment at a gynecologist's office. The five years had passed on my IUD and it was time to get it replaced. I spent the last year questioning my IUD. Should I get a new one? If I do, should I keep the same five-year one? Maybe I should get the three-year one. Maybe I should switch back to a non-semi-permanent option. The question is, why was I asking myself these questions? It was all a way to ask myself, do I want a baby? Do I want to prepare myself for maybe having a baby? That night after the appointment, I did decide to stick with the same IUD. I had a dream. I was looking at a male figure, my partner, and looked down at my arms and saw a baby. I smiled and tucked the blanket under its arms. Then I placed the baby down to my left 
engaged in conversation with a woman to my right. And when I looked back to my left, the baby was sinking into a mud hole. And I just watched as it sank and sank and sank, the mud enveloping its small body. So I'm sorry that was so long, but as you can see, the book Motherhood, despite my feelings about its lackluster writing, really took me to a place that I hadn't been to in a long time. So it was a book that just really became this really incredibly evocative uh, experience, despite me not liking the writing. And despite me thinking that Sheila uh, Haiti uh, as well is part of that masters of creating creative writing type style of writing. So that's kind of where my thought process was. I hope you didn't think I was too rude in my criticism. I, th I hope you can see where my position is. And I hope you can see that this is the process, the thought process that you should be having as a reader, or maybe not even you, you should, but that you can have as, as a reader. How we can, by exploring different time periods and different writers and different countries writing and different, um, just as we encounter all these things, you're going to find preferences, you're going to find um, things that you don't like at the same time. And that's going to, I don't know, hopefully, make your journey as a reader even more fun and even more interesting. So that's where I wanted to um, go with this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.